What is good? All of our listeners, welcome to another episode of Games and Groceries. My name is Adam. I'm Liz. And Game Pass has taken over my life. But I also bought Horizon Zero Dawn, so that's also taking over my life. <laughs> but still, Game Pass, great option. And it took over my life. Liz, how you doing? I'm okay. Yeah? Yeah. Just okay? Yeah, so last week we told you guys that I had a stomach flu, so I'm still mm -hmm. recovering. Um, still, I'm going to talk a little more, but yeah. still not quite able to talk a lot. But uh, 100%. Yeah, not at 100%, but I'm recovering. Yeah. I'm doing okay. I actually had a full breakfast. Yeah. And I was able to have caffeine this morning, so that's nice. I haven't had caffeine in about a week. Yeah. So I asked her, like, would you be okay to record this week? And she has uh, the go-ahead. So we're giving you all the entertainment for this week. And we're going to be talking about our E3 thoughts after sleeping on it. But before we get there, we have two segments. But before we get to our first segment, we'd like to remind you again to follow us on the social medias uh, on Twitter, at Gaming Groceries. So that's our official Twitter handle for the podcast. But you can follow us individually. I'm at Ace the Grocer. I'm at Journey First. So you can follow us there individually, and you can give us your love, give us your hate, whatever you want, or just be friends with us on Twitter. So you can check us out there. You can also follow us on Instagram, Games and Groceries, all one word. So we post uh, updates about the podcast, as well as gaming memes and maybe behind-the-scenes photos. I still have to give Liz the credentials for the Instagram, because she takes more photos than I do. Yeah. So definitely follow us on those social media pages. But speaking of pages, check out our website gamesandgroceries.com where you can listen to all of our episodes from the website as well as find out where you can listen to the episodes and read all of our articles that I write. I didn't get to an article this past week but I'm hoping to write an article this week so definitely check that out. Uh, and finally we'd like to remind everybody to rate and review us wherever you listen to the podcast and if you would like uh, you can send us your comments uh, just send it to me contact at gamesandgroceries.com so I can read it on the podcast I forgot to write down our past uh, reviews, but I will get to that next week. And I will talk about all the reviews that you guys write if you would like me to read it on the podcast. So with all that said and done, follow us, check out the website, rate and review us. Definitely check those uh, links out. There are no links in the bio, but definitely check out the website. <laughs> so before I muddle along anymore, let's just get into our first segment. Movie Minutes. Movie Minutes is a segment where we like to talk about the movies that we watched in the past week, whether it be on Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix, or in theaters, and we like to just give it a little bit of a rating as well as recommending or don't recommending. And this week, our movie is from Hulu. You can stream it on Hulu. It was a 2017 release and stars Shia LaBeouf. This movie is called Borg vs. McEnroe. Now, this is the story from the 80s from the two heavy tennis rock stars that were Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe, as well as they uh, faced each other in the final Wimbledon, or their first Wimbledon together. So, let's just talk about it. Liz, opening thoughts. I really enjoyed this movie. Yeah. Um, the only part, like, I enjoyed the whole thing. Like, we always say how much we love um, based on true story movies. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Clearly, we're all, it's already going to be high up there on our rating. Yeah. Um, but the one thing that I really wish they could have done differently is um, the towards the end of the movie where it's that where it actually gets to the big moment. Mm -hmm. It very much depends on your knowledge of tennis. And mm -hmm. I we each know a little bit, but even then we were still kind of lost. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 I when we watched it, I was like, oh yeah, it's no problem. Like we both love tennis and. You know, we mm -hmm. used to play, and so we know enough. Yeah. And um, we didn't know enough. <laughs> well, if you have zero knowledge of tennis... You're going to be extremely lost. Yeah. I wouldn't say extremely lost, but we'll yeah. get there. We'll, yeah. we'll get there. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But that yeah. was my only complaint about the movie, honestly. Like, that was the only part I didn't like, was that I mm -hmm. couldn't follow the ending. Yeah. Because it was a little dependent. So, let's to go into my first note. I have three notes here about this movie. Uh, my first note is that this film has a strong open. 
where you mm-hmm. get to see each player's humanity rather than just a montage of origin stories. This guy picked himself up from the ruts of Sweden, and this man uh, picked himself up from a Chuck E. Cheese. It, it, it didn't go. Th- it didn't go through that cheesy montage of origin stories, but instead, it put you in a place of where these two uh, players are professionally and their humanity and how much they just want a normal life. And it was one of the strongest open for these biopics that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy that open. So did you have any thoughts about that? I also enjoy the opening because it gave you... Now, I'm not as like analytical when it comes to movies as Mm -hmm. you are, so I don't really think about it till you say it. Yeah. But I did enjoy the opening, how it showed you where each player was in their life at that time. Their mental state, where they were. Yeah. Yeah, because... One was on the spectrum of he's been playing. He was like a child prodigy yeah. at this and he's been doing it. And he's like on his, on his, his fifth, fifth si- this is his fifth Wimbledon. Wimbledon. And if he won, it'd be his fifth win in a row. Yes. Um, so maybe it wasn't his fifth Wimbledon. It would have been his fifth Wimbledon win in a row. Yeah. Whereas the other one, this is John his McEnroe. Very, yeah. John mm-hmm. McEnroe's. This was his first Wimbledon ever. Mm-hmm. So, um, that just shows you not only, and they did, I think they said that even in the beginning, like this yeah. is, this is where each person is in their life. This is how they train. Like this is who they are yeah. and this is where they are. And I just, I, I liked how they explained that. So going in, you knew exactly yeah. what was going on. Cause there are some movies that throw you into the movie and you're like, where are we? What are we doing? Why are we watching this? Yeah. You know? So I liked how they started it off. For the people that grew up in the eighties, you, you kind of know, these two names already you know Mm -hmm. bjorn borg he was just religiously focused and uh, his mental state was like a machine like he didn't show any emotion at all whereas john McEnroe was the complete opposite yeah and yeah that's another thing i liked about the movie was that it explained why each of them was like that what yeah what in their training brought them to behave the way they do yeah when i say that the opening wasn't a montage of origin stories it told you about their origins at the right time. Yeah. It told you about their origins at the right moment in the story. Yeah. So it had to explain it. But yeah, John McEnroe, if, if you didn't know him, you did know him in the 80s where he used to break rackets, have, throw yeah. temper tantrums yeah. at the umpires. He uh, he was everything that John uh, Bjork wasn't. Yeah. So, uh, but that get, gives me to my second note. This is a story that defines the contrast between players that play with emotion and players that play with uh, religious focus, mm-hmm. right? You you have these two battling minds where John McEnroe was playing with like pure emotion and rage. Everything that was going through his head, he just let it out. Whereas uh, Bjorn Borg kind of bottled everything in. Mm-hmm. Don't show any emotion. Be religious about it. Everything, the, the tension of your strings has to be perfect. He stepped on his tension uh, of those rackets before every game. He had the same car to go to the same motel every Wimbledon. He was religiously focused and everything had to be to a T, mm-hmm. right? So no emotion whatsoever. And this to find the contrast between two types of players. Yeah. And I definitely uh, feel for these two types of players because Liz being married to me, this is why I don't compete in sports. Too much like he's not allowed to compete in sports. Yeah, just because (laughs) I can be both John McEnroe as well as uh, Bjorn Borg, where they they, uh, criticize Borg for being like, does that really matter? Does it really? Yes, it matters. It it matters entirely. It doesn't really matter how tense your strings are. Yes. Uh, He was incredibly uh, specific with his equipment. And that's exactly how I'm like. But I'm also like John McEnroe, where you have anger issues. Yeah. <laughs> I like to throw basketballs at people. Uh, you could say that I'm a little crazy, but that's why I don't compete anymore. But you, you see this definition of contrast between these players. Uh, my third and final notes is that everything good about this movie, right? It has engaging cinematography that every single shot, it feels like you're in the scene. It, it feels like you're in the world. It feels like you're watching a documentary, mm-hmm. right? So, so the cinematography is beautifully done in this movie. Uh, in terms of storytelling, it's brutally human. 
It's brutally human that you, you get into the mindset. You feel like you are these people. You feel like you are John McEnroe. You feel like you are Bjorn Borg. Uh, it's so brutally human that you can't help but feel for these two players. And it told origins when it was necessary. But I shared my uh, note with Liz where my fault for this movie is that it's very reliant on your tennis knowledge. Mm-hmm. And it tries to explain it. It really does. It, it does its best to explain what yeah. tennis is to the point where it was at the last uh, game in Wimbledon, the, the, the final game. And instead of like breaking the fourth wall, no, 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 they, they wrote in uh, a sports contrast, uh, con, uh, sports commentator. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Brain. Uh, sports commentator, where instead of like saying, oh, for those who aren't into tennis, he wasn't breaking the fourth wall. He was talking to the audience yeah, within the, as if you would pay for tickets to Wimbledon and not know anything about tennis. Yeah. For those who don't know anything about tennis and and he started to explain how sets work and everything and it was just so awkwardly written that it's yeah. just like I understand that not everybody who's going to watch this movie knows tennis, but this is just so awkwardly explained. Mm-hmm. But uh that was my fault for it. But in our final minutes about this movie minutes uh, what would you give it out of 10? I gave it an eight and a half. As did I. Yeah, because it was a good movie. We really enjoyed it. Um, it was mostly just that reliance on your tennis knowledge that brought the score down for me. Yeah. Whereas they really, they could have done that final scene in a different manner so that it wasn't quite as confusing. Yeah. Now, I also gave it an eight and a half. Now, in our rating scales, an eight is a solid movie and a nine is a near perfect. I would say this is a little bit above solid because this is a solid film and then some. But to say that it's near perfect, I feel like is a too strong to, to call it. So I gave it right there, right in the middle between a solid and a near perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this movie really engages you all the way through. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's only an hour and 48 minutes. So it doesn't overstay its welcome. There, There's really not a lot of slow parts either of this movie. No, not really. In fact, there's some points where it kind of chops up the story to, yeah. to just get to the chase. Yeah. So it never overstays its welcome. You, you, you're you engaged the entire time. It's brutally human. And it stars Shia LaBeouf. It's yeah. 2017 Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. So, and it, and it is really nice to see Shia LaBeouf getting back. Mm-hmm. into acting because he's a good actor and he played the perfect john McEnroe. he did he did like he, it was incredible i was waiting for him because this is 2017 shia labeouf so i was waiting for him to just say just do it but he didn't thank the lord for that oh, i was so upset he didn't do it i was betting on it but that's why he needs to get back into acting so people can stop doing that i know but i would recommend this movie we always end this uh, segment with, like, I would recommend it. I would highly yeah. recommend watching Yeah, we watching. definitely recommend watching it if you have Hulu. Yeah, if you have Hulu, definitely check it out. It's only an hour and, eight, hour, hour and 48 minutes. So I highly recommend watching this film, especially if you didn't know the story behind Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe. If you didn't know, that's even better because now you can just watch it as a movie. But yeah. for those who grew up in the 80s and knew these characters or knew these players, it's even more entertaining just because you knew the story. Yeah. So I do want to say, just keep in mind that we also have Hulu live. So there might be some movies that we find on Hulu that you might not true. have if you don't have live. So if you can't find on Hulu, don't be mad at us. It's just because we have live. Oh yeah. And I, I don't know if that was because of live or because it was on Hulu or not. So. I think it's on Hulu, but yeah, I think it's just on Hulu, but I'm just saying there might be movies in the future. Right. That, it, that we say is on Hulu and you might not be able to see. Yeah. So, I think it's a good time to jump into our second segment. Top 3 Gaming News. The Top 3 Gaming News is the gaming news that we saw in the past week, and we like to rank it 3, 2, 1, just to keep you informed and condensed about what's going on in the gaming industry. So, let's just jump into the number 3 Gaming News. This is all coming like from the tail end of E3, so this was a crazy big week of gaming news, but... There's three specific pieces of news that we th- we found the most interesting. So let's talk about uh, number three. This is coming from Don't Nod, who is the publishers and developers 
Oh, wait, Square Enix publishes. So Donut is the developers behind Life is Strange, which we always go with the episodes on. You'll always find an episode about Life is Strange episodes. So let's talk about this. Donut announces that Twin Mirrors, their, their new uh, IP that they were going to release this year, Twin Mirrors will be pushed back to 2020 and it will be exclusive to the Epic Games Store. Now, why is this news? It's because of the two quotes that were said. <laughs> So it's according to uh, Eurogamer that don't not share that they have a one year deal with the Epic Game Store and it will release in 2020. Now, the two reasons. Now, why is it releasing in 2020? First quote, uh, to release it in 2020 in order to optimize the gaming experience and capitalize on Twin Mirror's success potential. All well and good. I, I enjoy that. So what do we think about that quote before we jump into this next quote? to optimize the gaming experience to capitalize on Twin Mirror's success potential. Any thoughts? It's a lot of big words. Yeah, wait till we get to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I just, can I read it? Yeah. To optimize. Because I need to like really be yeah. looking at it. Sorry, learning disability. Yeah. Um, to optimize the gaming experience. Where am I looking? <laughs> right here. Sorry. Uh, oh, I was looking oh, at the complete. Right oh, here. okay. Optimize the gaming experience to capitalize on twin twin mir twin mirrors. Okay, twin mirrors success potential. So it's just to say that yeah, like they want to make the game better, yeah. so that once you get the game, it's not this buggy mess like um, Life is Strange Two yeah, was. Yeah, I mean it's good for them to do. Yeah. Um, that's very nice. Mm hmm So. Yeah, it I, really is. Like, all right, you want your game to have a good release. Yeah, and that's just it. They're they're just optimizing it, yeah. so it's not this buggy I mess. I appreciate not a pre. I appreciate actually putting out a finished game for once. Yeah, I appreciate that. That was fine. That's why they're pushing it back to 2020. When in 2020, we don't know. Yeah. I'm assuming March because that's when the fiscal year ends. That's where they try to release games as yeah. much as possible. So I'm guessing March 2020. Uh, why the epic? Uh, why the Epic Games Store deal? This is the quote. This is where the gaming news comes in. Epic, uh, the Epic Game Store deal, we signed the dotted lines because the terms of the deal, get ready for this audience, ensure a more advantageous distribution of revenues. I have to read that one more time. The deal ensures a more advantageous distribution of revenues. That is a quote, people. I feel like he uses a, th a thesaurus. Yeah, it's like, uh, what was that Mary Poppins thing? Like... Uh, extra, I don't know. It's but supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. That's what this quote sounds like to me. <laughs> um, let me read that more slowly. An advantageous distribution of revenues. Uh, translation: Because money. Yeah, money, please. Money, pl like you, you made it so <laughs> big words so that we would think that, like, oh, we, how dare you make money? Just say anytime someone comes out and says we're we're on the Epic Games Store, they they do this whole PR stunt as if we're we're not aware that game developers need money. Yeah, you know, uh, it was kind of like when Rocket League said that they were we're coming to the Epic Games Store and they said, oh, so that we can release it so that other users can can use our platform or get yeah. a new audience. Like I would totally respect if they're just like, well, we're releasing on Epic because it does offer us more of our money back yeah and it offer it it allows us to pay our developers more money yeah and like, i can totally accept that and I, I respect that entirely if you're doing it because you you want more of your money that mm -hmm. you're putting into it that's fine yeah it's fine it's just that the way they're putting this out is just like can you just stop? It's not annoying. It's just like, can you just stop? Well, I think the reason they're doing is because they know the Epic Game Store has a lot of hate and they yeah. don't want to seem like they're, um, oh, Greedy? what's the word? I'm, no, they don't want to seem like they're advertising. That's mm -hmm. not the word I'm looking for. It begins with an I. Yeah. The one I'm looking for. But Inferno? they don't. What? I don't know. But, but I don't want them they don't want themselves to seem like they are saying what Epic is doing yeah. and how what they are as a platform is okay. Yeah. So they're trying to hide the fact that they're using Epic just for the money. Yeah. Because they know that Epic has a lot of hate and they know people don't like that they're using Epic. Exactly. So 
let's just jump into our number two gaming news. But before I do that, I, I just want to read the quote one more time because it's just... He thinks this quote <laughs> is the funniest thing in the world. It is. An advantageous distribution of revenues. That is the most convoluted way to say that I need money, which yeah. is which is fine. Um, so let's just jump into the number two gaming news. And this is from Todd Howard. And he talks about details of Starfield gameplay and visiting SpaceX with Elon Musk, uh, which he describes SpaceX. He describes it as the Avengers meets NASA, which is nuts. That sounds so, fun. So let me read some. Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, let me just read some quotes here. It's a game, but we, it still has authenticity. And talking about which fuel they use, like they, they start talk, they start talk, d- discussing about what fuel source they would have in each space station. And he says that the fuel we would use is helium three, which is a fuel source, which is up for debate in terms of what, what what's necessary in a modern day in the future space shuttle going from SpaceX helium three. Uh, he says that we have to gamify some of it, uh, so it won't be as brutal as real space travel. But he starts to say that we want to keep it as grounded as possible, but it's still a game and we have to gamify some of it, but we want to be as grounded as possible. In terms of traveling in space, uh, our game, like Flight in the 40s, it's still dangerous to go and explore, but people still do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So before I get to my last note here, it sounds like Starfield is supposed to be as grounded as realistic. And it sounds like Elon Musk is part of the um, uh, pe- people who, who are in the art department. I can't I can't think of it. But yeah, he's he's part of the concept mm-hmm. realm. Uh, he's helping them keep it realistic. Yeah, exactly. So this is very promising. And again, I have one last note here, but we'll talk about it in a bit. It sounds incredibly promising. However, we've been promised games before. And it's all just come to just garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that? What was the game recently? Um, uh, Fallout oh, 76. Oh, my goodness. 16 times the detail. And it's and it works. It just works, yeah. he says. Uh, it All these different promises and all this stuff and hype. And how did it come out, Todd? And even he knew that it had bugs. So for him to talk about how grounded this game is, and we haven't seen anything. We've seen a logo. I'm not getting my hopes up. Yeah. But I like where his mindset is. Yeah. I I appreciate it. And their concept for 76 was great. Yeah. I remember when they showed you and talked about how they drove all over West Virginia. Yeah. They made they wanted to make that as realistic as possible. Realistic is fine as long as you know you also have the game being good, right? <laughs> um, but also to keep in mind that if they're going that into detail with how things work in space, mm-hmm. sometimes and we, I think we've had a podcast about realism in yeah. games is that they put too much. I hope it's not boring because they yeah. keep it w- too realistic. And that's what I don't like. I, I like the escapism. But it sounds like he still has escapism in mind because he even says we have to gamify some of it. Yeah. So, so hopefully they don't do so much realism that it's it's just a struggle to play the game. Yeah. Uh, my final note on this is that uh, Howard also described Starfield to be as realistic with today's tech that's going to be implemented into the future of saying, uh, how are those things actually going to work in the future or how are they going to look in the future? So he's uh, partnering with Elon Musk going to SpaceX and Elon is telling him, this is the technology we have. These are our plans for the future. This is how space shells are going to work 30 years from now. Uh, he, he's actually partnering with Elon Musk. It sounds to say that this is what it's going to look like in 50 plus years. Yeah. Right. And so he's thinking, okay, this is how sci-fi is going to look 50 years from now. So he's trying to keep it grounded, not just grounded, but as realistic to the point of what kind of fuel you put into your, Mm -hmm. to your shuttle helium three. Again, like what he said, it just sounds like it's, it's, it's getting too grounded. And it's not enough escapism. It's not a Bethesda game, which I, I get. It's fine. But 
I have to see it to believe it. Yeah. I still I still remember two years ago or no last last E three where some people like talked to Bethesda and they're saying this is going to change the way games are made. This is going to change the way. This is going to like change everything about how games are developed. And I'm like, that's a lot of talk, you know? Like yeah. that's a lot of talk for a game that we know nothing about. Yeah, much like No Man's Sky, but. Here it is. So I'm excited for his mindset. I'm excited for this game. I'm very excited for this game. I appreciate Elon Musk is partnering with this game. Yeah. But I have to see at least concept art. I want to see concept art of this game. Yeah. Before I get super, super stoked that I'm uncontrollable, you know? Yeah. Also, can I just point out yes. how great of a life do you have to have that you're being paid to go visit spacex and talk yeah. to elon musk and they went you know when they were doing 76 they went to west virginia and drove around like what a great life you must have that you get paid to do this stuff someday I get paid to do that stuff i want to be paid to go on vacation someday but not today so let's uh end things off with our number one gaming news uh, oh man, the 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 sound bar is over there, and I can't press the rumor alert button. Button. Oh man, rumor alert! Rumor alert. So not as fun. I know. I have to get like a long stick now and just like poke the button. Should we get you like one of those grabbers. Yeah. So let's just talk about this. Number one gaming news: Phil Spencer comments on the possible future of Game Pass on the Switch, which is actually pretty feasible, actually. So let me go over my notes here. Uh, with more Microsoft IPs coming to the Switch, like Cuphead, Minecraft, and Banjo is in Smash. As soon as Banjo came into Smash, it's just like, okay, Microsoft is going all in with Nintendo. Uh, but when I saw Banjo in Smash, I was kind of like, okay, so he's coming back to where he belongs, you know, yeah. on Nintendo systems. Yeah. Um, questions start to arise at, okay, Microsoft is going all in with Nintendo. Uh, in a conversation with Giant Bomb, uh, Phil Spencer had this to say about the future with Nintendo on Game Pass. Now, this is kind of a lengthy quote, but bear with me. I have a screenshot right here. Phil Spencer says this. I've said over time, I like to take Game Pass everywhere. He has a smooth voice, by the way. Is that why you're talking like that? Yeah, baby. Uh, we're, we're, focused on stream, uh, we're focused on the streaming side, at least, on Android. Just because in some ways it's the hardest for us because it's so diverse in terms of numbers of devices. I love the role that Nintendo plays in the industry. I love the fact that Minecraft Dungeons was announced there and we have a really good relationship with them. There's obviously Banjo and Smash, but the platform is different enough from an Xbox platform that it's not trivial for us to say, okay, all those games would run in there. So then you're like, okay, I'm actually reading these quotes. So then you're like, Okay, we're going to stream games to there. And I love what the Switch is. But the opportunity globally to focus on an Android platform is just a natural first move for us. And frankly, it will take us quite a while to work through that. So that's the focus for us right now. Let me read that last sentence. And frankly, it will take us quite a while to work through that. So that's the focus for us right now. Final quote, a final paragraph. Not really paragraph, sorry. Uh, but I want to have the best console experience because of what it gives you. I want to be sitting on the couch with an amazing experience and it sounds great. I have access to any game that I want to play. And if I want to take that while I'm on the go, I think the Switch is a really cool platform for that. It's just that in the near term, it's kind of hard for us to prioritize different than where, where we are today. Mm -hmm. So talking about that a little bit. Uh, before we get into our talkie time, uh, I think this is feasible. Uh, my, my final note on this is that uh, Game Pass on a Switch, you won't see, I'm, I'm assuming you won't see Xbox Studio games. Uh, talking about Double Fine games, you won't be seeing Ninja Theory games. So you won't be seeing those on the Switch. But there's a lineup to be viable, uh, viable especially uh, indie titles. Because I, I was exploring my Game Pass on PC and excuse me, uh, it's Game Pass on console. And they're similar, but there's some games on the PC that's not on the console and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the Nintendo Switch Game Pass will be mostly indies or uh, Minecraft, like uh, uh, Microsoft IPs that they're willing to share with Nintendo. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, but it sounds like from the quote, it's something in the future, but not something that they're focused on right now. Yeah. You know, and they're focused. It sounds like from that quote, they're they're focused more on the streaming side. They're X Cloud. And once they get X Cloud out there to the public, we're gonna get um something from Xbox in October for the X Cloud. It sounds like once X Cloud is like right there, yeah, good to go, then they will prioritize to getting a Game Pass on Switch. Yeah, it seems like they're gonna be focusing more on getting Game Pass maybe on the next generation of Switch. Yeah, if there is, uh, or or like a new model, because there is a rumor. Yeah. There's still a rumor going around that. Uh, Nintendo is manufacturing a new Switch model. Yeah, so maybe they're focusing more on that. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely agree. Maybe after um, X Cloud is out and fully functioning, yeah. then they can focus because it takes a lot to code and create mm -hmm. these things to get it on certain platforms. So they can probably can only make their focus on one thing at a time. Yeah. So they're focusing on X Cloud now, and maybe that is next in line to have it on the Switch. No, exactly. So I'm hopeful for it. Yeah, it's a great idea. Yeah, because I love my Game Pass on console and PC. Like, I'm yeah. loving it. It's definitely worth $14.99, even though I paid a dollar for it and I have it till December 2020. Thanks, Microsoft. Um, I very much like the value of this. And if it comes to Switch, that's even way better for Switch users. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, but don't get your hopes up. It's not coming out this year or even 2020. I would assume that xCloud is going to be the main focus and then you'll get it on your Switch. But it sounds pretty hopeful that Game Pass or at least a version of Game Pass will come to the Switch pretty soon uh, from what Phil Spencer was saying. Yeah. So I think this is a good time to jump to our final segment. Talkie time. So our talkie time is a segment that we talk about uh, every single week. We like to give you a gaming topic and just have a conversation about it, whether it be female gamers or uh, do graphics really matter? And we want to give you a gaming topic every single week to have a conversation about. And we like to ask you, the audience, to continue the conversation with either us, your friends, your family, your dogs. I don't know. Have a conversation with anybody that you want, especially the doggos. So this week's conversation is all about our E3 thoughts after sleeping on it. Now, now that E3 is said and gone, we want to go back and just think, okay, instead of doing it with emotion, we slept on it. Here are our thoughts. But before I, we get to our thoughts, this is a comment on our YouTube uh, video. So we are also available on YouTube if mm -hmm. you'd like to see that. We might do a video pretty soon, but it's not promising a lot. It's just that we don't have the equipment to do it properly. Yeah. It's just going to look crummy, and we would rather do it proper than give you crummy uh, video content yeah so this is coming from uh, grumpy dad gaming and he says fantastic episode really enjoyed this thanks grumpy dad uh with the ex with the exception of a few things i felt overall this e3 was underwhelming follow uh jedi fallen order looks pretty good but where was dragon age 4 i i say that too uh cyberpunk has been and still is my most anticipated game by far Outer World seems to be coming along very nice. I agree. Uh, Gears 5 will, will be good. I agree with that too. Uh, absolutely loved Hellblade. Now, this is an important one. Absolutely loved Hellblade, but had zero interest in Blading Edge. Also, I agree. Yeah. Final thought, Bethesda not even sure why they showed up. Lol. And I hearted it. <laughs> so that's coming from Grumpy Dad Gaming. So let's just talk about it. RE3 thoughts after sleeping on it. And the first note that I have on here is that was this the most average or the most boring E3? And I'm kind of on both sides here. Your thoughts, average or most boring? Well, I'm not sure because we were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. And the first E3 that I really sat down and watched was last year. Yeah. And last year was phenomenal. Almost everyone had at least one game that they released day of e3 everyone had it seemed like it yeah yeah like unravel 2 yeah that was a good drop that, yeah that was that was amazing mm -hmm. um and then almost everyone had something big to announce mm -hmm. it was flashy it was great and i loved it and then comparing it to this year i was like this year's so boring 
But yeah. I don't know if that's average because I haven't watched any previous years. I've only watched 2018 and 2019. So in comparison between those two, this year was boring. Yeah. So as we talk about this particular topic, write it down in the comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, write it down in the comments. What's the most average, the most boring? Give us your thoughts as well because I like to read through your comments quite mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, I would like to say that this was the most boring E3 as well. Because if we're going on average, right, you you come out of E3 just saying, eh, that was okay. But this was the most boring and most bland E3, that yeah. at, at least as far as I can remember, I feel, overall. Yeah, like I feel like after each one ended, tour even before it ended, we were all looking at the clock like, is it over yet? Yeah, like, especially. Like, are they done yet? Like. And then there were times, like, since I was sick, I would, like, suddenly, like, click back in. I'm like, they're still talking about this. <laughs> yeah, especially Bethesda Showcase. I think I gave that a 7 out of 10. This is why we're going back after sleeping on it. Yeah. So Bethesda was just, like, a 3 or a 4 because it was just so boring. Um, and that's just it. Overall, we're talking about. We're not talking about every single one. If you haven't checked out our thoughts on E3, you can check out part one and part two on whatever uh, podcast platform you can check it out. Um, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about an overall. Here's the GPA of yeah. E3. And I would like to say that this has been the most boring because, like you said, there are some segments, especially the middle of Square Enix. Enix. Yeah. Like between Final Fantasy VII Remake and Avengers, just that middle section was just like, okay, okay, yes, Dragon Quest, yes, Final Fantasy, oh, another Dragon Quest, oh, here's Final Fantasy again. Yeah. Okay. And it just yeah. kind of It was dragged. like a struggle getting through each, yeah. each showcase. Or even Bethesda, it was just a lot of games we already knew about. Yeah. And... Some games that we didn't even get gameplay on, and I was excited to know more about, like Ghostwire Tokyo. Okay, great. Uh, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> can I see more? Yeah. Can I see more concept? Can I? Can you talk about it more? Or Deathloop? And we were taking like almost like bets for Bethesda. Yeah. And we were saying like, oh, it's going to last thirty minutes. Oh, it's going to last forty minutes, forty-five minutes. What wasn't it like an hour and twenty minutes? Something to yeah, that? I think it was an hour and 20 minutes. I was like, that's ridiculous. Because you're yeah. like, oh, it's only going to be like 30 minutes. Like, you yeah. were so short. It was going to be so short. Because mm -hmm. I remember my original prediction was like an hour. You're like, oh, really? I think it's going to be a lot shorter. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'll change it. And then it ended up being an hour and, and 20, 20 minutes. minutes. It was insane. On games we already knew about, like Wolfenstein 2, uh, The Young Blood, uh, uh, Doom Eternal, we already knew about more, more about Doom 2016 that you can play on your phone now. It was just all these games that we already knew about. And that, that yeah. was my second note. Overall, this E3, I feel like... I'm not trying to say this as a fact. I don't have the statistic like, oh, th th this at this much percentage. Then last year, in my heart, in my feeling place, right here in my chesty, um, this had the least amount of gameplay overall. Yeah. And we just had a lot of talk about games we already knew about. Mm -hmm. And it just nothing really felt new. And, and when it did have something new, it was just like no gameplay. Yeah. Nintendo had the most gameplay out of everybody all, all put together. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a statistic. I'm just kidding. I don't have the statistic. I, I wish I had more stats for you. But in, in my feeling place, this had so little gameplay. And it just felt like you were watching movies the whole time. Then this isn't a cinematic uh, E3. This is E3. This is for video games. What are we going to be playing you know? Yeah. Because cutscenes are all nice and all. But did, did you have this uh, in your feeling place, too? The least amount of gameplay? Um, I feel like we just watched yeah, cutscenes. Yeah, we watched a lot of, like, trailers. Yeah. It, it was just cinematic trailers all the way through. and just like, like, they more of just wanted you to get hype for games. Yeah, it, it was just all hype. And you're just sitting there like, okay, but w how... How does what who mm -hmm. how can I play with my thummy thews? But you really love making up words today, huh? I do. <laughs> but that, that's just the thing. It's just like this was three days of just concepts, other yeah. than 
uh, Nintendo, which we'll get to, uh, this just just saw like here's how we think it will play, and even with um e- even with Ubisoft with that Rocket League make, and I and I did confirm I did watch that footage. It, their rollerblades are orange and blue, just like Rocket League. And I was like, what are you doing? Like goodness gracious! Uh, it was called uh, Roller League, I believe it was called. No, 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 Roller no. Roller Champions. Roller Champions. And you didn't even get to see gameplay of it. And it sounds like it's ready to go. It's uh, it's ready to be shipped out. Yeah. And we saw like zero gameplay. Yeah. We had cinematic gameplay. We we had gameplay where it just had a, like a little camera shake around, but we didn't get anything. And, and even more so, talk about no gameplay. There were some disappointing misses with this E3. Uh, as as Grumpy Dad said, there's no Fable Four. There was no Splinter Cell. And uh, Phil Spencer actually talked about this on on an E3 Coliseum, where he, where he said the new Splinter Cell. Like he kind of hinted at it because uh, when when they talked about new games coming on backwards compatibility for the new Xbox or or even this Xbox, we're getting all three Splinter Cells. We're getting Splinter Spell, Splinter Cell, Splinter Cell, uh, Splinter Cell, and then Pandora Tomorrow, as well as Chaos Theory. And they were asking him, why did this make a big deal? And he kind of hinted that there is a new Splinter Cell. And and I have to wonder, in a in a in a place where we're not getting gameplay anyway, why didn't we at least show that it's being made? Kind of like how Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 was announced. Uh Jake Valdino had a really good concept where uh before Ubisoft shuts down, the lights go off. You just see the black screen and you see those uh, three lights that come from uh, Sam Fisher's headset. And then you get to see Michael Irons. Uh, you get to hear Michael Ironside saying, oh, I'm here. Sam Fisher. My name's Ar- my- Michael Ironside. That- that's my best one. But <laughs> there's a lot of games missing. That was just like, why, why didn't you at least show something? But instead, these were games we already knew about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, that brings me to my next point is that there wasn't as many leaks as last year. Last year had like a like a mess of leaks, mm-hmm. especially from Walmart Canada, uh, but also not overwhelming with surprises once we got here. Yeah, there wasn't many things that was like, oh, and we hid this from you. Yeah. Like there wasn't anything surprising that made it more interesting. Besides Keanu Reeves. Yeah, that was awesome. But that's the only thing in the whole conference. Yeah. We were surprised once. Exactly. When Whenever I hear somebody saying Xbox One, E3, Xbox One, I, I watch the video and I read their articles and all they really talk about was Keanu Reeves. Like that was a highlight. Yeah. And I, and I have to ask you, what else beyond Keanu Reeves really shook you? Yeah. Like really shook you. Because when Keanu Reeves came out, that was where I was like, woke up like, whoa, cool, Keanu Reeves. And we just watched Point Break, too. Yeah. Uh, well, I watched it for the fifth time. You watched it for the first time. I watched it for the first time. But, uh, yeah, that, that was the only thing. And and you have to think that people were saying like, oh, Xbox. I'm like, okay, beyond, let's say Keanu Reeves wasn't there. What would you have thought about it? Yeah, what would you? Yeah. Because that's what we said. We would have given it like a four, but because because of Keanu Reeves, I gave it like a five or a six. Yeah. But if Keanu Reeves was not involved, you know. Now, going back to not as many leaks, right? And I was talking to you prior to E3 coming, and I kept like saying over and over again, not that I was looking for leaks, not me, no, no, sir. Um, I couldn't tell if this was a good sign or a bad sign prior to E3. Yeah. I was saying, okay, this could be good because now E3, the ESA, uh, the Electronic Software Association, they're getting pretty uh, secretive and they're not letting anything out. So they're actually doing a good job. But on the other hand, it could be bad because there's nothing to show. And it turns out it's the latter. Yeah. And so I, I just said, this could be good. This could be bad. And turns out... Nothing was shown. Yeah, that's why there, there wasn't was as many to show anyone. That's why there wasn't as many leaks prior to E3 because you get to the show and it's like, um, okay, like wh- anything else? Not yeah. like a one more thing. In, in fact, um, one of the one of the better showcases were the ones that weren't really showcased, like Limited Run Games and Kind of yeah. Funny Games and uh, Devolver Digital. They they had the most entertaining. Yeah. 
uh, and, and most uh, amount of games to like really excite you over. Yeah. Including Skatebird. I really wanted to back that game. Yeah. But yeah, so it was just very dull and boring. No, mm-hmm. min- not many leaks. Now, let's just jump right into Nintendo, though. Talking about boring and least amount of gameplay and not as many leaks. And it was just like so drab. We ended on such a bright note with mm-hmm. Nintendo's E3. With the amount of insanity with, that was shown, we got that banjo reveal in Smash. Right after you got like, oh, this Dragon Quest hero is now in Smash. Everybody's like, oh, cool. Thanks. Great. And then you get the banjo reveal. It's like, oh, he's back with Nintendo. And you got that Animal Crossing New Horizons, which, by the way, uh, March 20th is actually National Day of Happiness. So they're releasing it on National Day of Happiness, Animal Crossing. You got Luigi's Mansion 3 with Gooigi. Adam really loved Gooigi. I want to be Gooigi when I grow up. Okay. Th- those are my life goals. I'm going back to college to become Gooigi. So I guess we'll have to get you a Switch. I guess so. Definitely. As well as the Breath of the Wild sequel. I, I think people are remembering E3 to be better than it was. And what I mean better than was, I'm talking about like above average. Yeah. You know, like a six or a six and a half because you ended on a really good note with Nintendo, you know. But it, it just like it's lucky that Nintendo kind of saved E3 here. Right. Because the whole conferences before that had nothing to show as well. But then Nintendo comes around. Gameplay. Great reveals. Uh a lot of value for your Switch. Uh, Animal Crossing. Finally, some news about Animal Crossing. Uh, more news about Link's Awakening. Now you can uh, mess with dungeons a little bit. There was so much value put behind your Switch. And that Doug Bowser intro, it was the most entertaining, right? Uh, did you have any other thoughts about Nintendo's conference? No, I did. I mean, I found it very entertaining. They had interesting games mm-hmm. to offer. And I agree that they, they were... One of the more interesting ones of E3. Yeah, they definitely won the whole conference yeah. just by default, I feel like. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of competition. And, and here's the other part. People were saying that, well, you know, I think it was boring just because Sony wasn't available. I don't think that's the case. Yeah. I really don't. They're just saying like, well, it felt like something was missing. In, in my mind... It wouldn't matter if Sony was there, right? It's not like Sony carried E3, in yeah. my opinion, Yeah. right? It's not like Sony carried things because even Microsoft, even EA last year with uh, the Sea of Solitude reveal and Unravel 2, EA had some heavy hitters. It was cringy, but they had some heavy hitters. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of conferences, especially Ubisoft. When Ubisoft had that emotional rush, Oh, that's the other thing uh, that wasn't shown. A new update on Beyond Good and Evil 2. Mm -hmm. That wasn't shown off. And you had this emotional state with Ubisoft. And you're just crying over these developers. And Microsoft was just coming out bang, bang, bang with like great sets and Forza Forza games. Um, It wasn't just Sony. But because Sony was gone, everybody thinks that, oh, it's because Sony was gone. No, even if Sony was there, Mm -hmm. you know. But here's the other thing. Even if Sony was there, the whole reason why they weren't there is because they have nothing to show. Yeah. So if Sony was there, keep that in mind is that you would even think that, okay, even Sony was boring Mm -hmm. because I had nothing to show. So they took the right route and saying that, listen, we have nothing to show. Why even go to E3? So we're just going to do our own thing. So even if Sony was present, you would still walk out of E3 thinking that was the most boring E3 ever because Sony would have put that nail in the coffin. Yeah. You know, do you agree with that at all? Yeah, I agree. I don't think Sony would have made a difference in anyone's overall feeling about E3. Yeah. Um, Because even with the, um, the, 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 the whole directs that they do, yeah state of place yeah the state of yeah. place even those you, you just walk out of it like oh cool cool like honestly yeah. it's just like that was that was nice yeah, not saying that they couldn't do a flashy presentation at e3 it's just more of that means you're expecting sony to have been so amazing that it made you forget about all the other terrible showcases yeah, exactly you know what i mean like it's that one mm-hmm. 
that one platform is not going to change your overall feeling. Yeah, exactly right. And and that's just it. It's just that Sony would not have saved this E3. In fact, yeah. it would have just confirmed that this was a boring E3. Yeah. Honestly. Uh, and not to say that, you know, as an Xbox fan at all, right? Yeah. But it's just to say that Sony had nothing to offer either. So that's why they opted out, right? Yeah. So speaking of showcases that didn't, you know, pull out on anything new. <clears throat> Let me just uh, go on my little my little list here. Ubisoft. I got a I got a bone to pick with you, Ubisoft. Where's Did you just underline? Yes. Where's Aisha Tyler? What have you done with her? Where's Aisha Tyler? Where are you holding her captive, Ubisoft? Cuz here's the thing about Ubisoft's presentation. I had the most confident, the most uh, hottest of takes of, of Ubisoft to say that Aisha Tyler would make an appearance once again on Ubisoft's showcase because, okay, 2017, they had the developers take the stage. Well, all well and good. I agree with that sentiment. Great. And it was such an emotional showcase in 2018. It was also led by the devs. But it wasn't as great. It wasn't as emotional as 2017. So I had in my mind that they're going to bring back celebrities, right? They're going to bring back a celebrity guest to run their showcase because they have since 2012 to 2016 with Aisha Tyler, the the most beautiful woman to ever grace the stage besides Liz. What? I don't know. But with her quirkiness and just her funny demeanor, right? Yeah. Aisha Tyler would come out on stage. But who comes out on stage? Not Aisha Tyler. Yeah. In fact, four celebrities were shown or mentioned at Ubisoft's. We got John Bernthal and his good, good puppy. Yeah, I mean, you got to see a puppy. I did. Bam Bam was a good dog who deserved a steak and all of the bones that were ever existed. Yeah. Because Bam Bam is a good dog. Floki, our dog, is not a good dog like He's Bam Bam. Sleeping. Angel. He was not as good as Bam Bam. But bringing it back, uh, we got John Bernthal. We got Rob from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Rob. Mm, no, I don't know. I can't remember how his name uh, is. Mc, McEnroe. Just kidding. No. Uh, and then they also mentioned uh, Jessica Chastain. Is that Jessica? Uh, Christina Chastain? I can't remember her name. Rats Bananas. But her, as well as Jake Gyllenhaal, doing a uh, Division Netflix series coming very soon. So these are four celebrities that were either shown or talked about. Mm -hmm. And I tweeted just saying, like, listen, if Aisha doesn't poke her head out of that curtain, I'm going to flip. She did not poke her head out. And I was just a little bit frustrated with that because yeah. they, they asked all these celebrities. But that just would have been... The simplest of fan service. You're willing to bring out John Bernthal and this Rob guy from Philadelphia, which we're from Philly. I appreciated that. But you could have at least brought out Aisha Tyler for just one game announcement. Just one. That's all I asked. I need Aisha back. I know, dear. I'm very desperate. But that's what was really disappointing to me about Ubisoft is that they... they they looked like they thought they were bringing out the big guns. Yeah. But they weren't willing to service the fans, right? It was all great with Watch Dogs Legion and all that. That was that was wonderful. That that looked phenomenal. Will it go through as promised? Because Watch Dogs tends to overpromise things and it does not deliver. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Are, are you excited about Legion at all? Um are you excited to play as a grandma? Sure. Yeah. But it, it seemed like it was just uh, way too out there for Ubisoft to pull over. It looked interesting, but yeah, I think what we said was we need to learn more about it before we get too excited because it seems like a very um, ambitious project. It seems very, very ambitious to say that everybody in the map is playable, it's recruitable, but it's just that 
listen, Ubisoft, not only do we have not good ties here, not not only do I not trust you because Aisha didn't say it was good, but this is this is a franchise that's well known as very infamous for over promising and not mm -hmm. delivering. You're you're kind of stepping on some I won't even say thin ice, but you're stepping on glass, sir. You're you're you keep saying these promises about this particular franchise. Yeah. And that never delivers. Although I did have fun with Watch Dogs 1 and 2, but keep in mind I didn't buy them day 1. Mm -hmm. So much like Division when that first came out, a lot of promises, a lot of um a lo a lot of gameplay shown that wasn't actually there day 1. Ubisoft doesn't have a good rap record about delivering on promises, but this particular franchise, you know, mm -hmm. and Aisha Tyler would have made everything better for me. But even more is that Ubisoft left with a whisper of an announcement. Yeah. You know, uh, with gods and monsters. I was waiting for just some, like a little bit of gameplay, just like a little bit, you know? Yeah. But instead we just to get to spend a little bit of a hillside and see the main character who looks like Cassandra from Odyssey. And that, that was it. Yeah. That, then the Griffin came up and then, oh, show's over. Yeah. And it's like, oh, is that it? Yeah. That's it? Like, that's all? That's it? That's it? And I feel like that ending really summarizes this year's E3. Mm -hmm. To say that you, you left E3 and just like, besides Nintendo, was that it? Yeah. Especially with Xbox. Mm -hmm. You know, um... Let's talk about Xbox for a little bit. Uh, they really marketed this on Twitter. They, they really marketed this to say that we're going to talk about next gen. We're going to talk about how powerful it is. We're going to talk about how it's going to change your life. How when you see it, you're going to poop your pants because you cannot handle the glory of Xbox Scarlet. Yeah. What did we get, Liz? As you slurp. Sorry, I didn't know you were going to ask me a question. Yeah. Um, we got nothing. We got jargon that's what we got we got them ssds we got them virtual rams we got them ray tracings we got them basically everything that playstation already said because i was uh reading about uh what what's going to be in the xbox card and it's quite similar to how playstation said it like yeah. we're gonna have massive amount of ram ssd uh, a Navi chip. I think the Xbox Scarlet also has a Navi 2 chip as well as um, a custom made AMD. And I was like, isn't that exactly what PlayStation 5 is doing? Yeah. This is exactly what PlayStation is doing, which is encouraging. But also at the same time, let's see it. Like, we didn't even see the shell of it. Yeah. And it was just like, can we at least see the prototype? Can we at least see that that boomerang of a controller like PlayStation announced? Yeah. But but nothing was shown. It was just talked about. And and you ended it with just saying that, okay, now I know that my game pass is valuable, but I know nothing about this Xbox Scarlet. Yeah. At all. And you just left it like saying, is that it? And that was it. You know? Yeah. So like we said in our previous, in our part, part one, we just said like, okay, Xbox was good if they marketed to be, we're going to give you as much value behind your Game Pass as possible. If this was a Game Pass showcase, mm -hmm. blown it out of the water. They did wonderful. Yeah. In, in fact, I'm very confident with my purchase in Game Pass Ultimate, especially because now I have gold, Game Pass on console and Game Pass on PC, mm -hmm. right? If they come out and say that, oh, it's also going to be on Switch and it's included in your Ultimate, by golly. Yeah. But this whole conference, right? The Xbox conference, Microsoft conference. Yeah. Yeah. If this was marketed as a Game Pass showcase, this was blown out of the water. You get yeah. Gears 5. You get Outer Worlds day one. You get all these games. You get it on PC. You get Fez on PC, which is amazing. Play Fez on PC. It's wonderful. It's delightful. But they didn't market it like that. No. They marketed it to say that this is your first look at Scarlet, and it didn't deliver. Yeah. All they did was just talk like we're doing. And, yeah. and just like it's coming out of holiday 2020 and even said that Halo Infinite is going to be a launch title 
And we didn't get any gameplay. Yeah. It was just Master Chief come out like, Arr. like, oh, Master Chief, you're awake. Oh, yeah, I'm awake. Give mm -hmm. me some coffee, boy. No. And, and that was it. I, uh, it was just so upsetting. And I don't mean to like complain about this, but it was just like, what was the point of this? Yeah. You, you just walk away from E3, not saying that E3 is dying. I don't say that. If you read my article on uh, gamesandgroceries.com, I worked pretty hard on it, uh, about is E3 relevant? I think it can be if the people behind PAX and uh, all these other uh, pretty big expos and yeah. showcases, if they got to run it instead of ESA, I think uh, E3 will be well on its way to becoming great. But here's my final note on this. This E3 was just a weird eye of the storm to the next gen. And, yeah. th and this is what I said prior to E3 coming. The reason why this was so boring and so bland is because they have plans for 2020. Yeah. They have plans for the next generation of consoles. And so this year, it's just like, listen, we can give you a lot more detail next year. Yeah, I feel like next year's E3 is going to be more interesting because it seems like they're going to have a lot coming out. Exactly. And I really wish I I should have looked up 2012's E3, the Eye of the Storm, before the next generation of consoles came out in 2013. Yeah. Uh, for 2020, it, it's just that they're waiting for the next systems to really yeah. show you gameplay because then they can show you the hardware. Then they can show yeah. you the power behind these consoles. 2020 is going to be fascinating. But this year, there wasn't a lot of memorable things. You got your Keanu's. You got your John Bernthal dogs. Uh, but there wasn't a lot to take away to like member or to for the member berries. Yeah. There wasn't a lot to just say like, whoa, that shook my life. Even, even Animal Crossing. You have to wait until 2020. Yeah. It's kind of like, whoa, I can't wait to play it next, next year. year. Yeah. Or Avengers game. Whoa, I can't wait to play it next year. Yeah. Uh, or Cyberpunk. Whoa, I can't wait to play Cyberpunk in April. Yeah. There wasn't a lot to, like, shake you, you know? Yeah. And there was no look at Scarlet. Here's my other notes. There was no cringe. Mm -hmm. There was no memorable cringe. There there was some cringe at Bethesda's with the guy who was like, huh. Or, or the guy that shouted all the time and was like, yeah, whoa. For mobile games? Like, yeah. why? But there wasn't a lot of memorable, memeable compilation on YouTube cringe. You know, I live for that cringe at E3. I need that cringe at E3. And there was no cringe, not a lot of cringe, nothing to take away, nothing to write at home for, nothing to meme over, no kind of cringe like that. And it was just kind of like, there's no nothing memorable. It wasn't cringy. And the heavy hitters were just rare. And it just felt like the most bland, boring, this exists kind of E3. Yeah. And what's even more interesting, yes, PlayStation 1 isn't there, but you also have to remember that EA and Nintendo technically were not a part of E3. EA had their own conference, EA Play, and it was across the street from it. It happened the day before E3. They technically were not a part of E3. And same thing with Nintendo. They technically were not a part of E3. They just had their direct. Yeah. Like in the line of E3. Yeah. So we have EA, PlayStation, and Nintendo technically not being a part of E3 and just having their own showcases. So it was just kind of this weird year where it's just like there's nothing really to take away from this. Nothing really to just write home about. Nothing really to get psyched over. Nothing really to just blow your mind and just say, like, this is my gaming year. But I will say that 2020 will be very, very similar to 2015 in terms of game releases. Heavy hitters, mm -hmm. right? Games like Witcher 3 came out in 2015. Games like Dragon Age Inquisition. You can have your opinions about that. I believe that came out in 2015. Uh, they had all these different games. Oh, um... I can't even think of it. Halo 5 came out in 2015. That multiplayer was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So 2015 was heavy hitters with game releases, and that's what it's going to be like in 2020. Mm -hmm. It's going to be some heavy hitters. You're going to be very satisfied. You have Cyberpunk 2077. You have Animal Crossing New Horizons. You've got uh, you've got Twin Mirrors, apparently, coming out in 2020. 
So you, you got to wait until 2020. And then next year's E3 2020 is going to be mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, I'm still thinking that PlayStation will not return. That That's my, my prediction that next year, uh, 2020's E3, you still won't see Sony. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft's going to make a huge impact because they're going to put even more value behind the Game Pass and show off the Scarlets. Yeah. You know, actually show it off. Yeah. That's the other thing. They didn't give us a name. They just said Project Scarlet. And I'm like, yeah. now's the time to at least... Tell us what you're calling it. Yeah, can you at least tell us what it's called? Stop calling it Project Scarlet. Can we at least know what it's called? The Xbox 720, the Xbox 2Zs. I don't know. The Xbox Banjo. I don't care what it's called. It's just, can you at least give us a name? Yeah. And it was just the most bland E3. But Nintendo definitely won this year with their insanity. And that Breath of the Wild sequel is coming out soon. I guarantee it will come out 2020. <laughs> I guarantee it. Probably not. But I'm still hopeful. But at least Animal Crossing is still here. And we'll be paying off Tom Nook until Breath of the Wild sequel comes out. So any any last thoughts before we close out of this conversation? No, I think we covered all the bases. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, plus, it, it kind of like is a lot of effort for you to talk with your yeah. stomach issues. And that's why I kind of took over this episode. Yeah. Because one, I'm the most opin- opinionated about E3. Yeah. And two, it's a lot of effort for you to talk. So yeah. don't think that I just overtook this episode. It's yeah. just that... I'm just very opinionated. Yes, you are. Aisha? Is that Aisha over there? Hi, Aisha. Where were you? She she oh, wasn't. Geez. She's not in here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find out where Ubisoft is holding her captive, and oh, then geez. I'll let you know. Uh, anyway. So I think this is a good way to close off this week's episode. Uh, I just want to keep you informed that we are going to have a special guest coming on the show pretty soon, mm-hmm. coming in July. So... Keep your ears open for that. I'm very excited about this guest. I don't want to say who yet, uh, just to, because yeah. I want to uh, give him time to think about it. But yeah, so keep your ears open for that. So let's close off this episode. So if you were listening to this on YouTube, definitely leave a comment in the comment section. Smash that like button. Ring that bell. Blah, blah, blah. All that jargon, you know? Yeah. But definitely leave your comments in the in the comment section. I love reading those comments. Uh, give me your thoughts. Was this the most average? Was this the most, bo- most boring? Continue the conversation in the comment section. Uh, we want to remind you again to follow us on the social medias at Twitter. Uh, you can follow us at Twitter at Gaming Groceries, or follow us individually. I'm at Ace the Grocer. And I'm at Journey First. So you can follow us on Twitter. Give us all your love. Be friends with us. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Games and Groceries, all one word. And you can follow us to uh, get updates about the podcast, little pictures about our little puppy Floki, as well as gaming memes. So definitely follow us on the Games and Groceries Instagram, as well as check out our website, uh, gamesgroceries.com where you can listen to all of our episodes as well as find out where you can listen to all of our episodes the audio version of this it's all audio we're not filming this and uh, don't forget to rate and review us on wherever you uh, listen to your podcast whether it be on iTunes Spotify iHeartRadio definitely give us a rate a review and send it to me my way contact at gamesgroceries.com I think that's all I have to say uh, definitely giving me your comments on YouTube I think that's it. So any last thoughts? Any last words? Nope. Oh, okay. (laughs) So we want to thank you once again for listening to this week's episode. We can't wait to have you back for next week where we're going to talk about uh, something. Haven't planned that yet. Nope. But (laughs) we miss you, Aisha Tyler. Please come back. As well as Pete Hines. We miss you, buddy. Come back on Twitter. I know you're listening to this. No, he's not. But we thank you again for this listening to this week's episode. We hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, We love you very much. Have a good one.